we have all had the advantage of knowing the ending from the beginning in perhaps the most famous murder mystery in the history of Minnesota. I understand that, and so do each of you. On the other hand, you will not have a good or complete understanding of the case since by court order we are prohibited from releasing the FBI files. The place to start in our discussion of how the Jacob Wetterling investigation was conducted is not October 22, 1989, the date of Jacob's abduction, but January 13, 1989. It starts with the kidnapping and sexual assault of a 12-year-old Cold Spring boy. On January 13, 1989, the boy was wearing a snowmobile suit and was walking home from the side cafe in Cold Spring about 9.45 p.m. when he was approached by a man who pulled up and asked where Kramer lives. Note, Kramer's live in Cold Spring in this area, which would indicate the perpetrator was likely a local person. He also tells the victim following the assault he has an appointment at the Red Carpet Bar in St. Cloud, which would also seem to indicate he is local. After the boy approached the car, the man exited the car, grabbed him, and threw him in the back seat of the car and said, I have a gun. Don't try anything. The lad gave descriptions of the car descriptions to Deputy Hessian. He said it smelled like a new car. It was light blue, had bucket seats made of cloth, dark leather straps along the edges of the seat, a blue strap running through the center of the seat, a luggage rack, seat belts which automatically came on, child safety locks, and a transmission on the steering column. He described the perpetrator as wearing camouflage fatigues, dark gray zipper type vest, brown baseball cap, thick eyebrows, wide eyes, fat nose, possibly a mustache, rough dark skin, skin slightly wrinkled, broad shoulders, husky build, very deep voice, and ears that slightly stuck out. On January 14th and the next day, Chief Investigator Pierce takes additional descriptors of the perpetrator. White male with dark skin, five foot seven, five foot eight, broad shoulders, 170 pounds with a small gut. Ears that stuck out, larger nose, brown eyes, not wearing glasses, aged somewhere between 30 and 40, green camouflage army fatigue shirt and pants, possibly a gray colored vest, brown baseball cap with lettering on it, black army boots, talked in a deep voice, bottom row of teeth were crooked somewhat and a military style watch on his left wrist. Cold Spring Boy's description goes on to say there was a portable radio which was wrapped in gray duct tape sitting on the front passenger seat. The radio had an antenna on it, and he heard a short bit of radio traffic, specifically a male and female's voice prior to the subject turning the radio off. Obviously, a portable police scanner. Following kidnapping of the Cold Spring Boy, the perpetrator drove in circles and backwards for a little bit, Pierce writes. Exaggerated turns and trying to confuse him to the Pacific location. After the assault, the suspect tells the Cold Spring boy, you're lucky to be alive. Start running, keep running, to run or he would shoot him. Suspect keeps the Cold Spring boy's jeans and underwear. These are trophies. Now, on January 16th, Pierce writes, Officer Ziegelmeyer contacted this writer by telephone. Officer Ziegelmeyer indicated he had information regarding a possible suspect in the assault of the Cold Spring boy. Officer Ziegelmeyer indicated Danny Heinrich. That is a 1987 Mercury four-door Minnesota license, 086 Charles Edward Zebra. According to Officer Ziegelmeyer, Danny Heinrich's 87 Mercury has a light blue interior. Officer Ziegelmeyer indicated Danny Heinrich does know and is often accompanied by Dwayne Hart. Dwayne Hart will become important as this investigation unfolds. There is no mention in the file about other assaults of young boys in Painesville in the preceding years, even though it is clear that the Painesville Police Chief was talked to on February 10th 
1989 as part of this investigation. Now we turn to Jacob Wetterling abduction. October 22nd, 1989, at approximately 9.15 p.m. A masked subject approaches three juvenile males, Aaron Larson, Trevor Wetterling, and Jacob Wetterling, near the address of 297-48-91st Avenue in St. Joseph Township. The masked male subject abducts Jacob Wetterling. Tracks and footprints are found in the area of the abduction scene. And on the left, we see tire tracks at the scene of the abduction. Two days later, they are identified as Sears SuperGuard radios. You'll notice plaster casts are being made of those tire prints. On the right are adult footprints, along with what is believed to be mixed in with Nike footprints worn by Jacob Wetterling. Trevor Wetterling gives a description of the perpetrator. Five foot 10, wearing dark colored clothes, Nylon stocking over his face, armed with a handgun. Aaron Larson's description of the perpetrator. Wearing dark clothes, boots and gloves which are colored black, five foot nine, voice was rough and it sounded like he had a cold when he talked. He said, I got a gun, put the bikes in the ditch. Recall, Cold Spring Boy, I have a gun, don't try anything. On October 24th, 1989, at 3.40 p.m., less than 48 hours after the Wetterling abduction, a victim in the Painesville incident appears at the Sheriff's Office and talks to Benton County Deputy Tice, who is assigned to the task force. He speculates that the incident in Painesville are connected to the Wetterling abduction because the way it was done, quick, military, and proficient. May January 10th, Sheriff's Office reports Sergeant Noner, who is working with an FBI agent, interviews Danny Heinrich about the Wetterling kidnapping and writes, it should be noted that Mr. Heinrich bears a strong resemblance to the artist's conception of the abductor in the Cold Spring incident involving, again, name redacted. He is also about the same physical size and commented in our interview that he's a member of the National Guard out of Wilmer. And here we take a look at the composite done by the Cold Spring Boy, and we can look at Heinrich in the lineup in 1990. Note, as a result of the interviews of the Painesville victim, the task force appears to be focusing on Dwayne Hart, not Danny Heinrich. Also on January 12, 1990, Heinrich's 1982 40 XP two-door, blue in color, was photographed by a sheriff's investigator and an FBI agent. Quoting from Detective Munn's report of January 12th, photographs were taken of the tires which were consistent with those tires found at the scene, Wetterling, by gross tread design. And here we see those tires, Sears SuperGuard radials. Note, Detective Munn is called to the Wetterling abduction on the night of October 22nd. He is the detective who takes the plaster cast of the tires and the footprints left at the scene. On January 16, 1990, a vehicle, a blue 1987 four-door Mercury Topaz repossessed by the bank from Heinrich was located in Princeton. And you recall the Cold Spring boy saying, the vehicle had child safety locks. On your left, child safety locks. And he said the transmission was on the center council on your right. Cold Spring Boy is brought to the vehicle and says he feels his vehicle is similar to the vehicle he was abducted in and the boy felt the seat and stated the rear seat feels like the seat of the vehicle in which he was abducted. The boy viewed the interior of the vehicle and stated after viewing the interior he would not change anything on this vehicle. This officer then asked the boy on a scale of one to ten the number one being this vehicle being the least like the vehicle in which he was abducted, and 10 being the most like a vehicle in which he was abducted for the boy to rate this vehicle. The boy advises also on a scale of one to 10, he would rate this vehicle an eight or possibly nine, as this vehicle being similar to the vehicle in which he was abducted. In a statement to a Hennepin detective, the Cold Spring boy says, he, de he then said this man ordered him to pull up his underwear and jeans without touching 
his butt to the back seat covers, obviously. Danny Heinrich was worried about seminal fluid stains in the car. At this time, the vehicle should have been black lighted for seminal fluid stains in the car. It was not. A the interrogation of Heinrich by FBI agents is monitored according to retired Stearns County detective by agents from the Behavioral Science Unit Crime Profilers of the FBI National Academy, Quantico, Virginia. The file does not indicate that the profilers wrote a report about this interrogation. However, a retired Stearns County detective I have interviewed states profilers tell officers that they don't believe Heinrich did the crimes. We regard the interrogation as perhaps the most fatal flaw in the Wetterling investigation. Why? One of the agents who interviewed Heinrich was fresh out of the academy and perhaps had never interviewed a crime suspect in his life. Second agent interviewing Heinrich may or may not have ever interviewed a homicide suspect. Meanwhile, the BCA, the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension had supplied their most experienced agents to this case. And they were experienced homicide special agents. And I'm gonna give their names. Denny Fear, Gary Sigafus, Joel Cahoot, Don Tweedy, Everett Doolittle, Denny Owens. These are the agents that have taught almost every officer in this state about how to investigate homicides, whether in college, university, or with BCA training. They're, they were kept, according to those agents, at more than arm's length away from this investigation, running meaningless leads. There is no mention of Heinrich in the files for more than 20 years. We would like to recap why Heinrich should have been considered the main suspect. He was in the military and wears camo around Painesville. He lies and says he never does that. In the military, he would have learned to use mud or face paint to disguise himself. The mercury topaz used in the cold spring abduction matches the description given by the cold spring boy and the boy rates it an eight or nine out of 10 to be the car he was kidnapped in. A fiber found on the cold spring boy snowmobile suit is consistent with fibers found in Heinrich's mercury topaz. The Sears Super Guard radios match tire prints left at the Wetterling scene. Suspects are most often eliminated precisely because they do not have the tires. He has the tires. His shoe prints correspond to the shoe prints at the Wetterling scene, mixed in with Nike shoe prints worn by Jacob Wetterling. He has the shoes. The FBI is called in on October 22nd. They are a national police investigative unit and even an international investigative unit. They start wide and then focus in. In the first week, a lead is run in California, by the second week, leads are run in Iowa, Vermont, and North Dakota. In essence, Sheriff Charlie Graft has already lost control of his own investigation. This should not have happened. Local law enforcement, on the other hand, focus in and then gradually move out, much like a pebble thrown into a pond. We have made the case the perpetrator was a local person. It's inaccurate to say we focused on Dewey Hart and not Danny Heinrich. That's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. When Heinrich came to our attention, he does, maybe he doesn't know this because he didn't look, he doesn't, he can't read the files. But I don't know. We conducted a 24-7 surveillance of Heinrich for two weeks. And by when I say we, you have to understand, BCA agents, police, detectives, FBI agents were sitting in the same room, hearing the same information. No one was, no one said, you, you're such and such agency, you have to leave the room. That's outrageous. And it only shows me that he wasn't there. He shouldn't, he shouldn't portray that because that does damage to our cooperative effort. He says that the shoe prints were consistent and the, and the, uh, Tire impressions were consistent. They were. Do you know what that means in a court of law? That means nothing. And you don't convict people on some detective's 
idea that something is consistent or looks like or should have been or could have been, that doesn't work. And he knows better than that. He says that an innocent man doesn't act suspiciously when he's being surveilled. Baloney. People act crazy when they're being surveilled for any number of reasons beyond being guilty of the crime you're there for. And I've done hundreds of surveillances over the years. That's just silly to say that. I don't get it. He gives the impression that we disregarded Heinrich. My goodness. And I don't understand what he's talking about, about arresting him in a bar when he was drunk. I mean, that's not what happened. What happened was, after all of the agency's representatives got together and decided how to do this because there was nothing left to do. He wasn't identified in the lineup, there was no physical evidence, and you know, DNA wasn't available then. The decision was made, and it was a joint decision. I didn't say it. I never said, we're doing this, everybody shut up. It was a joint decision. The last thing we got to do is bring him in, try to lean on him, and see if he'll say something that incriminates himself or confess it. Here it is, 20 years later, the sheriff gets up and he's, he writes all these things down that point to Heinrich, which is fine. He writes them down and he tells you, all, what we should have done is no other leads, no other suspects, we should have given up and just interviewed Heinrich again and again and again. And that's ridiculous. I'm telling you, I'm doing this from memory. I remember a guy who confessed. He said, I kidnapped Jacob and I put him in this lake and we found him in the state of Washington. Are we supposed to not go and talk to this guy? Of course not. And he, the sheriff talks about using resources uh, uselessly. He doesn't know, he wasn't there. He so, says we gave uh, only good leads to FBI agents. That's ridiculous. We had a team that went through all of the leads as they came in. We had a group of phone answerers, about 50 cops or thereabouts. They gave the leads to these teams and the teams decided whether it was an A, B or C lead. And then they assigned it to the teams that were assigned to cover A leads, B leads, C leads. The teams were all integrated. We didn't say, oh, this looks good. Whisper, whisper, whisper. Don't tell the DCA, don't tell the police. That just hurts. For all the years that I've worked with the police and had such good relationships and friends, to hear this man say that we lied to them, we cheated them, we kept them out of the loop, please don't believe that. It's not the way it was.